the Ariel School um, incident of 1994, when um, school children at a uh, day school uh, outside Harare, capital of Zimbabwe in Southern Africa, uh, children of all different backgrounds um, uh, saw a, a craft landing uh, dur during recess. 60 different children um, uh, witnessed this and two beings apparently emerged and had some interactions with the children telepathically. Um, the children all described uh, the encounter uh, separately um, and consistently with each other. Uh, they drew pictures of it for John Mack. John Mack uh, dropped everything um, at the time and, and rushed there with a camera crew and um, and documented that case, which remains really one of the most interesting uh, cases to date because it involved children uh, who presumably were um, uncontaminated, you know, by the culture. They hadn't read books about UFOs and aliens. They hadn't seen movies about them. Uh, they were pretty innocent, and their accounts were, were quite consistent and, and compelling. So that that's one case that jumped out. And um, um, another case um, that John Mack investigated early that uh, I, I found very compelling and he found compelling uh, was a story of two girls, two teenage girls who had a sleepover. Um, and during the night, the mother, one of the girls, went down to check on them and the girls were missing. Called the police. They searched all over. They couldn't find the girls. And a few hours later, they turned up back in their beds. And later, uh, the girls both said that they had had uh, some kind of an alien encounter, that they had seen a UFO outside the window. Um, and uh, they described, you know, uh, some interaction with these beings. Um, so that case brought to light the possibility of third-party corroboration. The mother... Uh, who would t who testified basically to John Mack that the the, the girls were missing, and not in in all cases this was not true that people have been abducted or had abduction type experiences uh, when they were not missing. Another case that that John Mack uh, learned of that really was fascinating was of a woman who fainted in her husband's arms, and while he was holding her. She uh, had the sensation of flying up into the sky, being uh, carried, levitated, having these, you know, otherworldly encounters, and then coming back to her body. And he was holding her the whole time. So here you have the two polar opposites. <laughs> well, one case, uh, you know, the body missing. Uh, another case, um, the body being physically there. Um, so I don't know what you make of that. Clearly, this mystery persists. Uh, what what gets me are the people, the so-called you know skeptics and debunkers who are ready, you know, with a solution, and they say, well, they know this is sleep paralysis. Well, a lot of these incidents uh, don't happen at night. Uh, they happen when people are driving in their cars or uh, out by by themselves, um, uh, awake uh, and about. So. Um, you know, John Mack looked into all of the possible explanations um, that the that the people were deluded or mentally unstable or mentally ill, or that um, uh, they were having a nightmare, or um, that they were making it up for profit. You know, or publicity and all these explanations quickly fell by the wayside. Um, because they just don't hold up. These people are not looking for attention on the country. They're fleeing from it. Um, um, there's no consistent pattern to, to the people who are encountering this. And in some cases, they're the young children, in some cases really young children, like two years old, who um, uh, you know don't even read. Uh, you know, they just, one little kid said, Mommy, you know, little man, take me up into the sky. I fly in the sky. And um, so, and in, ca in some cases, there was fragmentary evidence, like you know, uh, 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 signs of a UFO landing outside the window, broken branches of pressed down grass, um, and uh, as I said, these occasional third party uh, corro corroborations. Um, so, um, 
and scars in some cases that people couldn't explain how they got these scars. So all you know, it falls short of absolute proof. Obviously, it does, um, and and we don't know in what reality uh, these things are taking place. Um, but clearly, uh, from from John Mack's extensive research, uh, and I've talked to some of these experiencers myself, um, the the easy explanations, you know, don't add up. It is a a, a signature. Um, a hallmark uh, of, of the phenomenon that it doesn't lend itself to being documented. People have set up cameras with trip wires and recording devices, and they 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 just don't record the the encounters. Uh, people emerge with um, uh, fogged memories or wiped memories. Uh, sometimes they're enhanced through you know hypnosis or uh, you know a, a memory enhancing. Uh, you know, procedures like uh, relaxation techniques, et cetera. But um, this phenomenon, as you say, you know better than anybody, uh, does not lend itself to um, to documentation. And often the experiences are, are the most confused. It's not like they're rushing to, to tell you of an experience and they know all about it. They don't understand themselves um, why they have been picked out. Uh, why are some people, for example, I, I never had a a, a, an encounter experience. Neither did John Mack. I've never seen a UFO. Neither did he. Uh, why haven't we? What gives this phenomenon such um, uh, immediacy, and I would almost say credibility, is the fact that um, uh, people like you are are uh, are not making up a story that it all hangs together. I mean, we, it no. is still so peculiar and so mysterious. John Mack, uh, uh, later in his life, I think, realized that a lot of these anomalous um, experiences uh, uh, seem related. I mean, um, that uh, he, he first thought that uh, alien encounters was something apart and very real. They were happening in, you know, uh, recognizable reality. Um, he began to doubt that because clearly they're not happening in a reality that we that we non experiences can recognize, um, and they're not documented. So it's happening in some other, you know, liminal realm, survival of consciousness and life after death and crop circles, other things that are also unexplainable, mm. uh, the way we understand you know reality today. But that does argue for. Um, expanding our our definition of what's quote real, you know, or, or what quote happens, um, and and there is no answer. This is, I guess, the what I came away with that um, uh, no one is explaining this. <laughs> All we can do is document it and say this is a phenomenon uh, that that uh, you know seems real, certainly to the people who experienced. It. It. Uh, there is some evidence, fragmentary evidence, that it happened, but um, uh, it's a genuine mystery, and I wish the skeptics would would tune into that and not be so quick to uh, uh, explain it away or ridicule it. These are accounts of, of experiences that, by their very nature, are impossible to prove, um, uh, you know, scientifically at this point, definitively, um, and yet. You know, John argued for the value of witnessing. He said we are left really with a phenomenon um, that that is based on uh, witness accounts, and uh, you know, and we we credit witness witness accounts in in court. Uh, people get convicted and sentenced to death on on you know witness accounts, even without you know even with only circumstantial evidence. Um, so we accept it there. Um, but uh, of course, there's a reluctance to accept, you know, one person's account, an anecdotal account, um, without any, you know, really powerful corroborating evidence, especially when the claims are so phenomenally weird. Stories get wilder and wilder. I mean, the accounts, uh, that's another thing that uh, impressed John Mack is that while there was a basic consistent narrative, general narrative of people who spot some kind of a craft, they spot uh, be you know alien beings they are transported through walls or windows solid you know walls 
to, to some kind of a craft, and then they're subject to certain pseudo-medical experiments, sometimes the taking of eggs from, from women and sperm from men for the apparent production of a hybrid race, which they are re-abducted later to, you know, to visit. Uh, the, these stories come up again and again, but the, the details are so different and singular and so uh, intense and, and particular uh, you have to feel it's uh, who would make this up? I mean, it's just impossible. The level of detail, the strangeness. Um, so that's that's a mark of this phenomenon that the stories are infinitely varied um, and and almost too strange to imagine. The phenomenon uh, is is real. It's physically real. The, these things exist. These UAP unidentified aerial phenomena. We used to be called UFOs. Pentagon doesn't like that term. I guess it's too woo-woo. They don't call them flying saucers anymore. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, whatever it is, um, uh, they physically exist. So they don't know where they come from, uh, whether they're intelligent, why they're here, and how they tra traverse these amazing distances, whatever. But they exist, and they are a, a potential threat to uh, our aviation. As you know, for years, the Pentagon was insisting that these things were mental aberrations, they were myths, they were fly specks on the windshield, they were uh, the, the planet Venus, <laughs> and mis, misobserved, like, you know, people would, don't know the difference between a craft with windows, uh, you know, and, and the planet Venus. But anyway, and now they're saying, no, these things, you know, uh, this it's something, it's something real. So, you ask if I'm optimistic. Yeah, I mean, the government is catching up with what a lot of people have been saying uh, for you, for for many years. So I think that's encouraging. Uh, they're not saying anything about uh, alien uh, origins or extraterrestrial, you know, connection, uh, because uh, they don't know. Clearly, they don't know. Um, so there's many more videos and longer segments of videos. Oh, the government definitely know. I mean, look, so they definitely know more than they're saying. I, I you know, I think that that that's clear. Uh, how much more they know, uh, or whether the government has in its possession, as you know, is often uh, whispered or you know uh, proclaimed on the internet, the government has in its possession retrieved craft or pieces of craft um, or entire flying saucers, you know, that are hidden away in hangars. I don't know that. <laughs> uh, that's uh, whatever the government has been able to retrieve, if if anything at all, is classified. Eric Davis uh, and some others uh, briefed uh, congressional staff on uh, reported uh, retrievals of material from crashed UFOs. Now, we didn't say that the government has these materials. We said that Eric Davis uh, showed slides, one of which we showed in the New York Times, uh, citing um, uh, the possibility of uh, materials obtained from crashed UFOs from off-planet vehicles, well, I think was the, the kind of the phrase, off-planet vehicles. Now, if, if, if congressional staff well, were briefed on that, that, that's interesting. That takes it up a level. It shows that some people, like Eric Davis, were comfortable, comfortable enough sharing this information with certain people in our government. Now, we, can, we don't know beyond that, you know, um, what, what's there. Uh, and as I said, uh, this is classified territory, and uh, you can't get, you know, uh, uh, access to this information um, at this point. Maybe in the future we will know more, but uh, there's a lot of in, you know stuff floating around the internet. But we, we've been meticulous in the New York Times to stick with stuff we can back up with, you know, uh, by sourcing it to a real person, not just an informed source says. Um, so when you, you know, you require people to speak on the record, it's much more difficult. You get a lot less, uh, but at least the, the information is, is worth more. Some of it is, is national security related. We're obviously in competition with earthly adversaries like Russia and China, who, by the way, seem to be just as mystified as we are. And they may be doing even more research because they don't need to you know, get permission from their people. Uh, they are, you know, more authoritarian, so they can do things without uh, having to explain them to to voters. 
Um, so, uh, but the, you know, the, the, that basically debunks the the idea that you know what we're seeing up there or underwater. Sometimes they're underwater, uh, emerging from and entering the ocean. Um, that these could be um, secret. Uh, Russian or Chinese or other foreign technology or our own secret, you know, weapons. Um, uh, but the, we, we have pretty much discounted that because, uh, first of all, we wouldn't, we, the U.S., uh, wouldn't be flying um, a UAP or UFOs in airspace where it could collide with our own pilots. It would be a terrible scandal if that ever came out. Um, and there have, there have been close uh, near misses. Um, and we don't think, we, the government, the people we've talked to, don't think that any country on earth has developed its technology to the point where they could be, you know, fielding these um, hypersonic uh, things with no visible propulsion that can, you know, reach tremendous speeds, appear and disappear uh, at will, go into the water, emerge from the water. I mean, who has that technology? It, it's it's pretty unimaginable if you believe that the Russians and Chinese developed this technology. Did they develop it before the Wright brothers? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that, that collapses pretty quickly. But, you know, the government has to say this because it's, it's one of the things you have to tick off, the boxes that you have to, you know, um, if you're being, you know, properly skeptical or conservative, you have to allow for is this within the realm of possibility? But then the more you know, you, you, you sort of discount that and say, no, that's not. You know, we're aware of, of some people who, who have had uh, experiences that they, they uh, you know, won't admit publicly or on the record, but will acknowledge privately in discussion. So, you know, one of the things John Mack found is that um, the, the group of experiencers it does include people from all walks of life, including professionals, law enforcement people, um, psychiatrists, uh, you know, a, a really a, a broad cross section uh, of people. And that would, of course, would include politicians. And uh, uh, Fife Symington, of, um, uh, he was the governor of New Mexico, I believe, or Arizona. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, he, ridic he famously ridiculed. Uh, an encounter story, uh, and later admitted that uh, he was wrong to do it. He made a big show of poking fun at. He had an alien, somebody in an alien costume, come on stage. Oh, that was the uh, that was the Phoenix Light. Yeah, the Phoenix, Phoenix Light. Light. Okay, yeah. Uh, and um, and then later he admitted that uh, he he should not have made fun of it. He uh, had reason to believe these encounters were truly mysterious, and. Um, but that's how politicians deal with it. Unfortunately, they they make fun of it. And um, uh, but the, the the number of people who have experienced this does include people in in government and people in high positions. Um, and uh, it, it, as I say, it's it's not easy to get them to admit that on the record. But uh, it is a broad cross. Look, Carrie Mullis, and this was in my article in the debrief, and it's in my book. Won a Nobel Prize for chemistry. Uh, very, uh, famous, uh, a very famous researcher who invented a way of uh, um, re replicating DNA quickly, millions and billions of times for study. So um, an authentic Nobel Prize winner shared the Pulitzer Prize for chemistry. And he had an encounter, nothing to do with a UFO. He saw a glowing, talking raccoon, he, he wrote in his book, uh, that said to him, good evening, doctor. And the next thing he knew, it was the next morning. Uh, he didn't. He was at someplace different uh, along the road. He didn't know how he got there, and uh, he had a flashlight with him that disappeared. Never could find it. And then his daughter called him. This happened in Mendocino, California, and and told him of an experience she had very similar. So he's a he, Nobel Prize winner had this experience. Um, so these things don't follow. Uh, a, a a normal storyline. There are you know talking raccoons and uh, owls that fly into the car, and then the next thing that people don't know where they are, they're you know missing time. Um, so these stories are, uh, are are very very strange. I mean, animals figure very uh, uh, largely in in these stories. Um, uh, people say they uh, 
were riding along a road at night and they hit a deer. And uh, then the next thing they knew, they, you know, they were on a different road and uh, they reached their destination uh, hours later and they didn't know, uh, you know, what happened and their watches stopped. And then later in relaxation techniques or so, they recall different parts of that. They were stopped, you know, by a strange vehicle, little men took them out. Um, this is very common, and I've heard these stories. And again, um, the people who tell them um, seem otherwise normal, uh, eminently sane, um, lucid uh, in every other respect. So I've talked to these experiencers myself, uh, and they, they uh, are otherwise perfectly normal. Um, uh, but they've had these experiences which they don't understand. And they're not looking for attention. On the contrary, they, they flee from it. Uh, they're afraid that people will dismiss them as, you know, as insane. And they know it themselves. People say, when we talk like this, people think we're insane. So they, they're the first ones who realize that. And that's why they're, they're so reluctant. They, I mean, they meet in uh, support groups um, and they share their experiences with each other. Uh, but they're very reluctant to, to come forward. Yeah. yeah. The debunkers who say, oh, yeah, they're looking for, you know, felicity. Uh, <laughs> couldn't be more wrong. There are um, stories of, of different races, alien races and beings, and, you know, um, reptilians and warlike beings and doctor figures that seem to be in charge and the the uh, the um, uh, robotic uh, greys that, that predominate Maybe maybe robots and in some to some thinking uh, because they uh, seem to react in a very robotic way and not not be the ones in charge. So um, you know what made me think a little bit about your experience with the orbs that that the things that are seen as, as one thing have a way of, um, of turning into something else. So people uh, you know sometimes see something and then in regression, uh, you know, procedures, hypnosis or whatever, then they realize that what they saw really turned into something else. But it, it, your, your experience brings that to mind. Uh, and again, uh, you know, there's a lot of room here for, for scientific um, uh, investigation. And one of the things I say in my book, The Believer, at the end is... Um, uh, science has devoted billions of dollars uh, to various uh, very worthwhile scientific uh, inquiries. For example, scientists succeeded in getting an image of a black hole 55 million light years away. And you can do to multiply the zeros to see how far away that 55 million light years, they have an image of a black hole. Now, they were able to get that with um, different... Um, observatories uh, literally around the world, all sending in pieces of a picture. And this is put together, and they have this very compelling image. Uh, also, just a few years ago, they found this elusive particle, the Higgs boson, after billions of collisions underground. Um, and they spent billions and billions of dollars to get this, all worthwhile. Well, they spend a tiny portion of that and, and, and trying to figure out what kind of experiences these people are having uh, which leave marks, um, and as I say, which come with fragmentary bits of evidence, uh, like uh, UFO sightings, and, and why some people have that, other people don't. Um, it's a it's a worthwhile scientific endeavor, and uh, uh, hopefully, science will get to the point, um, you know, where they can look. Avi Loeb, in his very fine book on. Uh, you know, this object that came into our solar system, Oumuamua, which he, he argues in the book um, was not a natural object. Uh, it might have been intelligently um, devised and, and sent into our solar system. By the time it was, re it was detected, it was out <laughs> again, it passed through. But um, he also argues for scientific uh, in investment. He doesn't believe, he doesn't like alien abduction because it goes through the human element and he said it you know um let, let's just stick to our instruments human beings are too complicated to figure out what they perceive so i get that but um 
uh, very interesting that uh, he also argues for, for greater scientific investment. I tell the story in my book of uh, two meetings that John Mack had with the Dalai Lama. By the way, it was never publicized. That John Mack kept transcripts of the sessions and his discussion, you know, like the back and forth with the Dalai Lama, uh, who is obviously no stranger to spiritual, um, you know, experiences. And it, it didn't seem strange to him, particularly that um, the people were encountering uh, other intelligences, um, uh, you know, uh, alien beings, uh, because in Buddhist um, uh, uh, practice allows for a, a big understanding of the subtle realms and other things that happen that not in the reality we recognize, but in other, other realms, other realities. So... Um, uh, I think it's it, it, it's a, a very rich subject for for discussion, and uh, uh, you know, physics keeps learning new things. We don't know everything there is to know. Yeah, I'm not saying that you know everything we've learned so far it has to be thrown out. Uh, on the contrary, we just have to continue expanding our understanding of uh, uh, what physics is showing us about the universe. We don't understand how how things influence each other while so widely separated or how people can get, you know, um, uh, f flashes of insight as to things that are going to happen, let's say, or remote viewing where they can see things, uh, uh, you know, thousands of miles away and, and get a, a clear picture in their mind of something that is far away. Um, uh, all this is in its infancy, uh, this size, but it certainly intrigued the CIA, which funded this research for a long time. Um, so um, there is a lot out there to investigate. You know, uh, some of the experiencers say that in their interactions with alien beings and their, their astral travels or so, um, they they encountered these beings who said that the, the UFOs are are mentally controlled. Uh, by them, that they um, uh, they th their their physicality somehow depends on how they're conjured up in the minds of of these beings, um, and th that's sort of what you're saying that there's a, a a mixture of spiritual and technological um, uh, that that comes together somehow, and uh, you know I mean again the, the the revelations in the UAP report that these things exist physically were, were, are really quite striking that now we we know from the government itself that these things have have left a signature in in reality um, they have a physicality uh, so they they exist they're not just some spiritual construct or archetype um, so now that we know that they exist physically we we can Try to pursue some of the other questions, like you know, well, where are they coming from? Who designed them? Why are they here? Um, but uh, it's it's a it's a beginning. It's a very small beginning uh, because it leaves open all the other questions. Uh, as a matter of fact, it makes the other questions more urgent. If they physically exist, well, how the hell do they get here? Uh, who designed them? Why are they coming here? What's the purpose? Um, uh, which, of course, those questions remain completely unanswered and mysterious. I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the more we know, the more interesting it becomes. And yeah, uh, you know, Carl Jung was disappointed to find that these things, well, I mean, he didn't know at that point that they physically exist. This, this He wrote about this in the 30s. Um, uh, so he said, but he said at one point, um, it's disappointing or would be disappointing to think that these things are real after all. So, um, but I don't think we have to take that as a setback. I think uh, on the contrary, uh, it, it's, it's very exciting to think that, um, you know, these things have, have some kind of reality. This brings up the whole, you know, all the research into psychokinesis. And so can you move objects with your mind? Can you kill people by thinking about them? You know what? What powers does the mind have? Uh, to that, can the mind cure the body? Um, things like that. But I think we are in the infancy of understanding the powers of uh, of the mind. And as you know, science keeps finding that consciousness is more than the functions of the brain. 
Um, I mean, the afterlife experiences that people have reported suggest that when the brain shuts down, consciousness um, continues and, and some, in some way from the uh, you know, life after death um, research, you know, survival of consciousness, which is what John Mack was involved in at the end of his life. He was very interested in that because Elizabeth Targ, the daughter of Russell Targ, the remote viewing uh, pioneer, she died early of brain cancer. It's a very sad story, a friend of John Mack's, and uh, there were stories that her spirit uh, sent signals after she, she died uh, that her family and friends uh, received. And, and, and John was working on a book about her and her family, uh, the power of, uh, the, of the realm of love, I, sort of the way he phrased it. And he himself, as I say at the end of my book, um, appeared or his spirit appeared to people after he died or so they told me, and I put it in the book, at the end of the book, so as not to, you know, uh, to position it, let's say, as one of the less uh, well-confirmed aspects of the story. Um, And yet it's there that people said John Mack appeared to them afterwards and they got signals from him and he was studying survival of consciousness and here he is. So, you know, who knows? But um, but that would seem to uh, add some... um, uh, speculation or whatever you want to call it on the ability of the mind uh, to transcend physical death. Uh, yeah. And, you know, those are the big mysteries still out there. Uh, are we alone in the universe? And what happens after we die? Uh, I am very optimistic. I think that, um, you know, people have been ahead of the government on this issue all along when the government was saying there's nothing to it. People were saying, oh, there is, there is something to it because I've seen these things. Um so sometimes the, the people have to bring the government along, um, and you know we we move toward the light slowly, but we we're moving you know as Martin Luther King said in the right the trajectory. It's a long arc, but um, it moves toward justice, and I think we we take steps forward, we take steps backward. Politically, you know the world is in a terrible mess. Uh, nationally, ditto. But um, uh, I think we're learning a lot. Uh, we're benefiting from our experience and it's not easy and you know there's still a lot of ridicule around the subject but uh, when you look back at what we came from that only a few years ago they they weren't even acknowledging the reality of, of ufos uap and now they say yeah they exist so i'm optimistic 